Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. Before we get started with the episode, I want to tell you about a new ebook available on our website called Buyer Beware. Why do they keep trying to sell you that annuity? This ebook covers the various types of annuities, negatives to owning annuities, and better investment alternatives to annuities. To download this ebook, you can click the link in the episode notes or go to wiserinvestor.com and you'll find it at the bottom of the page. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to the Wiser Retirement Podcast, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith. Guiding you to financial freedom today is my co-host, Robert Swarthout. Hey, Robert. Hey, how's it going? Good. Robert's the uh, founder and CEO, uh, portfolio manager at Teton Crypto Capital. And we do an episode, an extra episode every month uh, on topics related to crypto. Today, we're taking a more education mm-hmm. uh sidestep <laughs> yeah you know just <laughs> and gonna focus on uh blockchain yeah you know it's blockchain you know is the underlying technology of all the crypto stuff we talk about you know sometimes it's referred to as uh, d- distributed ledger technology but you know it's pepsi or coke it's all it's all soda so so you remember um well people still do this they say it's in the cloud Oh, where did yes. you say that? Oh, I saved it in the cloud, but no one really knows what the cloud is. And yeah. I think we should start there before we go down our okay. list yep. of it's in the blockchain. But what does that mean? It's like, you know, people say, hand me a Kleenex, mm-hmm. but there's different brands Hands of Kleenex, Kleenex in yep. different boxes. Yep. So at the, at the very core of all this, a, a, um, a blockchain is just purely a form of a database. You have traditional databases that you may use within a business system to store you know, financial data or customer data. You have more advanced database systems that you may actually use in the cloud, like an Amazon Web Services or a Google Cloud or something like that. That gets very techy very quickly there. But at the end of the day, a you know, blockchain is just really a a sequential uh, recording of history where each block refers to the previous block and kind of goes back and you know, it's uneditable. So, so at the end that you have a system that people can rely on that somebody is not in the database, just kind of changing some values. Um, so, you know, say it's your bank account, bank accounts are not yet in blockchain, but at some point they will be. And you don't want to have the bank to be able to come in and just twiddle with the numbers a little bit you can, um, uh, you know, ha- have, you know, the peace of mind to know that, you know, when you, when you add money or subtract money from bank account, it's going to be what it was before. So, and, you know, you think about keeping all your passwords on a Microsoft word document and hmm. you can easily, terrible idea. Back, you can easily backspace and edit all that. Yeah. And in a blockchain, you, you can't go edit a chain. You can add to it. Correct. But you couldn't go back and change a number. Yeah. You you can't go back and change something that happened in the past. What you would do in a blockchain world is say you had a value there that, you know, your bank account had a thousand dollars in it. Um, at that point, it's it's more of a summation of all the history that had happened to that point. Yep. And then you would add a positive or negative entry to that, um, to kind of affect your bank account. And what makes it that secure? It is, the way that the systems work where it's a bunch of computers coming to a consensus or doing math to kind of prove that that transaction did what it said it was supposed to do. And they call them confirmations in a lot of cases where, you know, a block um, from the word blockchain is a, a, um, you can think of it as a, a subset of time. Um, Some blockchains that measured in minutes, some that are measured in seconds, some are even down to, you know, under a second, but it's a block of time. And during that block of time, all the different things that happen get collected. The computers agree upon that, um, do the quote unquote math on that. And then they give it a, um, like a fingerprint of sorts um, for that block. Um, it gets, it's called a hash, but it gets hashed and then it moves on to the next one. And then that hash is referenced in the, fo- in the following one to kind of help you kind of, you know, if you wanted to kind of step back in time. So there's different databases that are doing this for different purposes. So you'd have one for the DMV <laughs> or you could yeah. have one for real estate. Right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, in the past, you know, you've, you know, the best known blockchain obviously is Bitcoin. It's system was not focused on any particular use case. It was more of like, in some ways, a proof of concept um, mm-hmm. for digital money um, is where the idea grew out of, you know, during the financial crisis and 
this are supposedly came out of the financial crisis and the idea that it's, um, you know, the fat Wall Street banks were getting all the, all the things they shouldn't be getting. Right. So you have a world where, you know, the technology's evolved. You know, it's been roughly around 14 years at this point. Um, the Bitcoin was by itself for a while. Then XRP came. Then Ethereum was really in 2017 um, came along and allowed smart contracts. And smart contracts, you know, we'll get to in a few minutes here, but like it really changed what a blockchain could do in a positive way, kind of created a much bigger expanse of surface for applications. And who are the creators of these databases? Is this Microsoft, Google, Amazon? Mm, almost who are the- never. In the, I mean, they may be piloting projects. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it could be a software developer in their basement. Um, it could be, you know, typically they're, they've had a lot of math education, um, cryptography kind of mixed in with that math. Is, uh, and just ways, because, you know, early on the problem they were trying to solve is not we know how to do a blockchain, but how do we make it where it can have more transactions per second? The throughput of it. Yeah. Or, you know, they're trying to solve for a use case like you're talking about, like, okay, we want it to store car titles. Uh, you know, that's probably just happening today. Right. That hasn't happened too much in the past. But, like, you know, there's special use cases that need to be solved for on each one of those. That will, not to say every use case in the world needs a unique blockchain, but at some level it needs to have flexibility to be able to do different things. So we kind of have the basis of how this is built. Um, so now let's get to our topic. How does this change the world? Yeah. <laughs> Very simply said, um, in a lot of different ways. And, you know, this topic comes up frequently when I talk to, um, you know, people that, about crypto. They're like, oh, how is, you know, is, isn't blockchain and crypto all, all we already know it is? And I'm like, to me, no. We're like, this is barely the tip of the iceberg that we're seeing here. You know, and the analogy that I've been using lately is to kind of help people understand the reference in time is if you, I don't know if you've seen this, but um, back in the, I think in 95, 96, the Today Show was talking about email addresses and Katie <laughs> Couric was on there, <laughs> yeah, Matt Lord, yeah. <laughs> and they were, and they spent a minute or two discussing like um, what, you know, what we understand to be an email address today, the at sign, right? And they're like the A with a circle around it. I don't even know how to say that. <laughs> like, you know, it's just that, that awkward stage, right? Yeah. Um, and they were even, when they were um, explaining what an email address was, they were leaving the periods out. Like, um, so, you know, obviously a learning curve there. And that's the moment I feel like we're in crypto. Because when I talk to people about crypto, there's there's just all this confusion. Um, maybe a, a smidge here or there they understand, but for the most part, people don't. And to me, that feels like a decent analogy. But, you know, that's... You know, I couple that with saying we believe we know what, what blockchain slash crypto will do for the finance world, but we likely don't even know a majority of the use cases it likely could solve down the road. Those will be uncovered as you know, pre, you know, the next generation comes along of the technology, right, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's a, um, you know, it's an ever evolving space. It's certainly, you know, over the last two and a half, three years, it has felt like the pace of change has extremely um uh advanced uh increased and in how fast things are getting solved there was more teams doing projects you know i was telling something the other day summer of 21 i felt like i could keep up with all of the crypto news that was happening on a daily basis for all intents and purposes not a chance anymore like even six months after that i couldn't do that like now that's why i have certain markets i focus on and you know for gaming for instance i don't pay attention to it at all but i know there's a lot happening there so, right, right. Yeah. So starting with that cryptocurrency, mm-hmm. um, obviously th- that is built on blockchain. Yeah. And, and that is, is that ob- the original use for blockchain, right? Is it, yeah. Is that I mean, right? that's the, the digital e-money that's Bitcoin grew out of, um, yeah. you know, and I think early on they quickly, whether they admitted or not realized that it was not going to be an e-money re- replacement just due to the, the restriction on how many transactions can happen as, in a particular block or on a per second basis. So, so you know, it's, that's why other t- um, uh, blockchains have come along that have been much more efficient at doing what they do that allow um, maybe for an e-money replacement type thing. So, yeah. But, you know, in the notes here, I, I we, we talk briefly about what I um, kind of been discussing more recently with people is an anything to anything transaction. People are like, first, they don't really understand how to wrap their head around that. People understand, like, I take my dollars and I go and I buy 
um, groceries at the grocery store. Very simple. It's dollars to give me goods. In a world where, you know, cryptocurrency is more prevalent, you could potentially not be holding dollars. You could be holding um, Casey coins and you want to go buy stuff at the grocery store. I have Robert doll, um, coins and I want to buy stuff at the grocery store, but the grocery store doesn't want either one of our, our coins. In a cryptocurrency world, there would be liquid markets for Casey Casey coins and just something that they would care about and vice versa. Um, and you end up where, where it all can be happening behind the scenes. So you don't even have to care what they want and they don't care what you have. And you just go and you just pay. Um, this is, it starts getting to a world where I think it makes sense to say people that live in Europe where they're always going across borders. Um, Americans were kind of spoiled in the sense that we don't really deal with other currencies all that much. Right. But you start getting into a world where it's a, um, you know, anything, anything, you know, your son may earn some kind of tokens in a video game he's playing, but he wants to go to the, you know, buy something at the gas station in that kind of world, that thing could exist. Um, so anything to anything, I think cryptocurrency kind of allows amongst many other things. So, so, you know, what I'm interested in is, um, and it takes government involvement, but removing the middleman from transactions, mm -hmm. you know, that, because so, you know, the middleman also collect fees, right? Yeah, typically high fees. <laughs> yeah. So th this is a, could be very promising. Yes. Uh, you know, the example I think that we can talk about here is if you're buying a house, you have a, um, an escrow agent or, um, you know, a, you have a title insurance, you know, the attorneys make a lot of money off of title insurance. Right. In a blockchain world where the house deed is recorded on a blockchain electronically and your funds could whether they're on the blockchain or they could be represented on the blockchain kind of tying technology together allows a transaction to come together the only reason why you're buying talent insurance is the off chance that the person selling the house doesn't really own it or have rights to own right. it and sell it correct so in you know that's one percent sometimes i have no idea what it is these days it'd have to be a small percentage you would think yeah, but still thousands of dollars typically on a house right. transaction that you kind of don't need to be paying in my opinion. So if you could uh, on a blockchain prove that you own the house that you're selling or you have your names on the deed effectively, all, you know, you don't need to, with, with finality and a hundred percent certainty. What is, what job does the attorney have there? Probably nothing. Right. So you could have a transaction set up with a smart contract saying, okay, Robert's got his money. You've got your house um, deed. Yep. Let's do this transaction. It, it it checks all of it as part of the code, and it basically gives us each what we're due at the end of that transaction. So, you know, so you can apply that to cars, car titles, house yeah. deeds. You know, anything where there's a middleman, like some, you know, there's escrow agents just for. Sometimes we're doing a transaction. You know, like my wife just bought a horse. In the horse world, it's kind of like pay me for the horse when the hauler picks it up. Well, that's harder to do than said. Right. <laughs> right. Because typically they don't want wires because I don't know, they're, they're probably trying to keep the money off the IRS radar. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, I think that we eventually get to a world where that's more electronic, but you know, do we trust the person like it, an escrow agent would make sense. I think in that scenario, there's right. not really, I mean, I'm sure there's escrow agents for horse sales, but they're not all that common as far as I can tell. Sure. So it's a, um, it's a world that's, you know, blockchain is in, in an interesting place in time because it is a technology that helps you replace the need for trust in a transaction. This world has less and less trust each day, unfortunately. Yeah. But the technology comes along and allows you to have the, the requirement for zero trust as long as you trust in the system. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, you know, what's the incentive for governments and other organizations to allow that to happen though? You know, I you, typically government only makes changes if, um, they screwed something up, they screwed something up <laughs> or they're, you know, they're lobbied for. <laughs> um, so you have that side of it too. That's true. I, I, I would imagine that the change, you know, cause certainly the probably some laws that need to change around say, you know, escrow or title insurance and that kind of stuff. Right. But I think that would probably more of a bottom-up type of thing. You know, 
somebody needs it, it happens in one state, it starts snowballs into other states, and maybe it comes. Well, to you know, some states don't even have closing attorneys. Uh, we correct. You know, I think Montana is one of those. Um, we helped the client purchase a home out there and mm. just work with a like a transfer company. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I could see in that space it, that being much more efficient, and maybe groups like that pushing it because mm-hmm. everyone in Montana is honest. Is that what that's saying? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. I assume nobody's honest. Yeah. That's probably um, a safe assumption. So tell me about, uh, you know, we, we talked about this in podcast probably over a year ago, but maybe two now, but um, th- think about like food uh, inventory or food safety. Yep. Like, you know, we had the whole lettuce scare a few years ago. Mm-hmm. So if, if all that was in blockchain, we would know exactly where the lettuce came from. Yeah. I mean, potentially down to the row in the field. Yeah, there's there's um, certainly. Would we know who bought it? We wouldn't know who bought it. We would know which grocery store had it, though, right? Um, in the world that we currently live in, we probably would not know who bought it, but there could be a world not too far from that that they know an identity, and it doesn't necessarily have to be your name, but they know an identity that bought that lettuce from you know that supplier from that row in the field. Yeah, so they could, you know warn you that you bought something with salmonella or whatever that's on the lettuce. You know, I, I'm really intrigued by this because not because we need to more efficiently tell the people that have the lettuce that there's a problem, but more so not waste as much food because we're trying to, because we, we understand the blast radius of the problem. Right. Because typically it's okay. We, we, th- we know there's salmonella. Okay. We need to get rid of all lettuce in the Southeast. Pro- <laughs> yeah. Probably not the right answer. Right. Um, but right now, I mean, they know where the problem came from, but we can't, we couldn't figure that out to specifically. We, we just assume the whole batch is bad now. Correct. Where, where we could actually potentially not have to eliminate all the food source. Right. In, I haven't followed this lettuce one as closely, I'll admit, but it's just generally, it's a very big hammer that they go to solve this problem with. Yeah. Well, and right, it can so. be right, but it could be a more precise hammer if data was more easily tracked and, you know, shared amongst people. Cause it's one thing for say the growers to track it, but are they sharing that data with the shippers? And then they sharing that with the grocery stores, basically zero chance. Yeah. In sure. a world where blockchain is public and they're all kind of contributing to that data along the way it's easier to kind of do that traceability. And it may be that, you know what, Kroger doesn't care about telling their customers, but maybe Whole Foods does or something like that, right? Like right. where there's some stores that pick up on that data and do something because they have your identity and the other one doesn't. Is all bo- blockchain public? They could be private there blockchain. Are, there are private, um, they call them private permission blockchains, but yes, private blockchains. You can literally run Bitcoin by yourself um, in your own house. You're Obviously, it's worth zero. <laughs> right, um, right. You know, it's functioning, not Bitcoin. It's using the same code. You know, but for all intents and purposes, they're public. So this is a big one. It would solve a lot of problems. Uh, digital voting. Mm. Yes. And so there would be no voting fraud. Uh, you well, know, the, or I, 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 <laughs> it'd be more complicated voting fraud. It would be more complicated voting fraud. And, and everyone has to have a device to be able to vote. Right, and we're getting close to that where all generations have some kind of technology. We're yeah. probably not quite there yet, admittedly, but we're close. And I even think that if we, you know, if, say tomorrow we decided as a country we want to have electronic voting, we, there could be some allowances because there's certainly there's people with disabilities that it probably would have trouble. Yeah. Um, Unless you could vote into the blockchain from a device that's portable. Portable or, you know... I don't know, ADA compliant or wh- wh- yeah. whatever the words are there. But like, it's, you know, I'm intrigued by this because, you know, partially I think it's, it's a, I don't like staying up late on election night be- to figure out who wins, <laughs> right. but I want to know. <laughs> right. Um, Lately it's taken a few days. <laughs> yes. Right. But in a blockchain world, you know, to me, the, the let me, let me put a tongue tied here. Let me back up a little bit. I think that there's, they try to do all these things to prevent influence when you're voting, right? It's certain times. You can't have people there with signs so close to the voting polls, those kind of things. I also think that there's influence with the East Coast starts voting and then the West Coast kind of gets to see it in Hawaii and Alaska. In some ways, we don't really care, 
care yeah, if they count. Right, right. But like they're the extreme examples. Like in a blockchain enabled voting system, it could all be recorded digitally on the blockchain. Nobody could see the results and it could be programmed to be like, okay, it is now 1 a.m. Eastern because now the, we know the polls are closed in all places. Yeah. Show, show all the results. Oh my gosh, it's 105. We know the results. Everybody can go to bed. <laughs> that is not good for TV revenue right, or TV no. ad revenue for those networks. Right. They can still have their talking heads, I'm sure. But like it's... <laughs> well, you still pull people coming out of the polls, I guess, and do all that. But that's... Uh, immediately we have found that that is not statistically accurate. It, well, none of it's statistically accurate in recent history. history yes. Yeah. The, the, the pollsters have gotten it wrong almost every, every time. time. Yeah. But I, to me, both sides complain about the election in some form, right? And, and they're in there complaining about different things too. I, I just, it, it seems like as a country, we would want an election that nobody complains about within reason, yeah. right? There are always gonna be somebody complaining about small things, but like, yeah, but, you know, they keep saying, oh, it should be a national holiday to vote. Well, it could be. Or it could, we don't necessarily need a holiday. You just vote from your phone. Yeah. Like, there, there's a lot of ways you could modernize that. Un- unfortunately, um, both sides would complain about something mm-hmm. and it probably would never, it would never happen. But yeah. if you were starting a new country. <laughs> yeah. Because that happens frequently. <laughs> yeah. And you had the, you had the resources. Uh, this seems to, this definitely seems to make sense. And mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that you have to do it for a presidential election you could you could start doing it uh you know there are plenty of small towns across yes. country across this country that would be i'm sure really anxious to implement something like this and to be the first yeah and i think that's where it starts it starts at the bottom and goes up it's not like oh my gosh we just wake up and say <laughs> the next presidential election is going to be on blockchain right right but yeah for your town mayor or you know, something not connected to a, a yeah. major election or it doesn't even have to be politics it could be like um voting for I don't know, something within a community. Yeah. Like it could start there and then prove itself to go to say right. a mayor race or something like you, that. You so. could choose, uh, you could choose like the, the concert series on the square. You could choose who you want <laughs> to show, <laughs> yes. show up each week. And then, you know, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> so, but, but something like that, th- that'd be a great testing ground because you could use technology and mm-hmm. then, uh, if it didn't work, who cares if you got, you know, the yeah. Mexican band and, you know, you got Jimmy Buffett instead or, you know, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a challenge with this digital voting outside of a small community race that doesn't necessarily need an identity is identities being on the blockchain. Yeah. It can't just be like, I have an email address and a password and I log in to vote because right. that, that is right for a whole different set of fraud. Correct. Uh, and, right. you know, I think we first need to get to where we have digital ver- um, versions of our IDs. We're getting closer in some states, Georgia being one of them. You can have your driver's license now on an iPhone. Oh, really? Yes. I didn't know that. Arizona but was the first one. Arizona, yeah, I think we're like Georgia being the first eight or something like oh. that. Um, Arizona, I'm going to do, that. I'm do that right after this podcast. So it's, it's a multi-step process. <laughs> you know how many that times takes, I forget my driver's license? Well, here, I'm about to say, maybe oh. give you some. Is that depth. too soon? Potentially. <laughs> so you can put it in your um, Apple wallet. It shows there after they mail you a piece of paper to verify your identity. Okay. okay. They're, they're trying to yeah. prevent, a, prevent a problem there. Right. It's, but it's only good at the airport. <laughs> well, that's when I need it the most. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then you're set. I, I have, I have clear. Uh, so I yeah. tell you, I don't need it at any in, clear any airport, clear, right. but it's only good at the Atlanta airport. Or, right. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, well, you may get to another airport that doesn't have clear. So you got to be careful there. Too. Well, no, no. What I'm saying is if I, if I, okay, I was just in Allentown, Pennsylvania. If I'm in Allentown, Pennsylvania, I show my ID on my driver's license. Is it still good there? I'm pretty sure it is because the new IDs that are federally backed that have the star on it, yeah. I believe are all part of that same system. Okay. And this is Georgia had to pass, each state has to pass a law to I so think, you, enact this. The big thing is if you get pulled over, you don't have a driver's license. It, that's not going to exactly. work. I mean, cause it, it will show your photo. You have to kind of go deeper into the wallet. It shows all the same data and actually a little bit more, okay. I believe, but it's just different. Right. I mean, like yeah, I look yeah. forward to the day that I don't have to carry my driver's license with me and it's just in my phone. Cause my phone is going to be with me. <laughs> right. And it's one less thing to have in my wallet. Yeah. So, but we're getting close, but like it is, you know, so identities are on some kind of electronic form of a database. It's almost certainly not a blockchain at right. this point. So like, how do we get it to where they're on a, on a blockchain? Then you have privacy aspects that you really need to care about at that point. Correct. Because I believe we talked about this podcast, like in a blockchain enabled world, you should be able to go somewhere. And if they, you know, say you're a restaurant, and they want to know if you're 21, 
they look at your ID. You're, they're also seeing your home address. They're seeing your height, your weight, mm-hmm. a bunch of other potentially other private data that they certainly don't need. Right. There's ways in blockchain, they call it zero, zero knowledge proofs, where they function could have their system ask, is KC21 in his wallet, in his ID would respond yes or no. They don't need uh, to know that you're 21 or if you're 70. It doesn't yeah. matter. You're yeah. of age. That sounds like something would get hacked by people and well, right but it can I be mean, done in the, a by the user so they could be 21 well i mean if, <laughs> if your id that is sponsored on this blockchain by and, and i guess That's endorsed true. by the state i mean there true there's ways to kind of get around the potential for i guess um editing or fraud there yeah um so interesting yeah there's a, there's a lot of layers to this but i think having identities on a blockchain really starts to unlock a lot of use cases that we're going to be talking about here. So. so we already covered a bit this, this a little bit ago, but basically titles, deeds and ownership tracking. Yeah. Um, that makes total sense. I mean, it's, you know, we were just talking about horses earlier. Horses have titles too. Yeah. That's right. right. I mean, so that's right. You know, that even that could be on a blockchain and even being able to like verify prior ownership mm-hmm. for it, for a transaction. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, you can go on, you know, say you're looking at a car, you go on Carfax and see that, oh, this is a three owner. You don't know who the other owners are. Not just yeah. you care who they are, but maybe you care about what states that car's been in. Yeah, true. I mean, maybe. Yeah. I mean, you may I, not want a car that's back, been in the Northeast. Yeah. As you know, I'm in the horse world too, where yeah. my daughter is. Um, we had a horse that was purchased um, that when it got re- registered to, to, to participate in the professional events, mm. um, the ownership was not correct. Like mm-hmm. basically there were three bill of sales missing. There was a bill of wow. sale from them to us, but not prior to that. And so in order to run FEI in the sport, you have to have, hmm. um, it's like a title search for a house. You have to show that you have all the titles going all the way back. Right. Well, what happened was three people were angry at each other. And wow. so they were like, the horse is basically repossessed at some point in its life. <laughs> <laughs> and then we come along and buy this repossessed horse, which was a great horse. Yeah. And, um, so basically, um, you know, is that like a salvage I, title on a car? <laughs> I'm Thankfully, joking. my my uh, daughter's cute. So I was like, "Here's this little girl. She mm-hmm. wants to do her dream, mm-hmm. and because you three can't get along, <laughs> right? She can no longer move up in the ranks." Right. And so uh, they all signed, and we fixed it. Yeah. Um, I was wondering why he was so cheap. I was like, "Why is mm. this horse discounted so much?" It's because the person who owned him knew that, but didn't tell us. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't until we moved up the ranks, we were, we figured out that, Oh, mm. that's why. Thanks. But no, thanks. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, blockchain would have solved all that cause it would have known. Right. Well, it wouldn't be able to complete the loop. Exactly. Right? And you, you, that would have been visible, right? Yeah. Versus yeah. kind of being a surprise. So, right. Exactly. Um, create verifiable portable data mechanisms. Explain yeah. mouthful. So, as long as I can remember the internet being around, they've always had this grand idea that healthcare data would be portable. So going from doctor's office to doctor's office, you're yeah. having to have, have them send the data back and forth. And I don't know. I can't imagine they're faxing it these days. They're probably just emailing PDFs or something silly. But it's, well, they have these portals now. Everybody right, which is portals. helpful. But I can't imagine all portals are talking to each other. Or even doctors review the portals, but that's a different problem. Right. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Um, but just having data that is portable, that is on the blockchain, that is private, but yet can be detailed enough for the people that need to see it. So this is a slightly different problem than we were talking about before. You want privacy to the data, but you want certain people that you verify or select to be able to see the data in whatever, you know, I guess amounts, whether it's full access or partial access. Yeah. You know, healthcare is the easy example you know, the education records, I think, is another thing as families move around. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, this is a bit of a hot topic in general, but, like, if you move across states, you could be getting different kinds of edu- educations. Like, do you need you know, do the, quote-unquote, credits transfer or classes transfer, all that kind of stuff. So you can make that more portable. And um, I guess just, you know, you know, when in my opinion, when information can move more freely, this is what the Internet did it opens up so many use cases and this is kind of the borderline of, we don't quite know what blockchain could do, but if we unlock that part, yeah. you could end up with a flood of other possibilities that could, you know, or that are unimaginable right now. So, 
is that uh, that kind of goes along with um, markets being created around things that aren't easily sold today. So, correct. Um, I think. Well, I mean, you have uh, concerts, sporting event tickets. Yeah, and we're starting to. I mean, it's not blockchain, but we're starting to do that now. Like we go to the Braves game. Mm-hmm. If, if there's a noon game, which is four a year, usually mm-hmm. we take we go as a team. Yeah, and this year I couldn't take a snapshot. Yes. of the ticket and pass it to everyone yep. on their phones because, because it now it moves and does it, all this yeah stuff. it has like this moving bar and there were so many people in line that had uh, pictures of their tickets and they're like i'm sorry we can't take that mm-hmm. that's so i don't know what kind of fraud they're dealing with to have to move to that but the bot chain could de- definitely solve it uh, yeah probably through an app of some sort yes i mean my understanding of, of at least the ticket situation you're referring to there's is somebody goes in with an electronic ticket and then screenshots it and then sends it to their buddy outside trying to reuse the ticket. Ah, uh, gotcha. Even I still have a criminal mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Check. Um, <laughs> I would assume that I would assume that, that once it's scanned, it says, Hey, I've been used. Yeah. Um, and you can't exit and reenter. So you think that would just solve the problem but, right there, but, but evidently not. But with it being able to be moved, you potentially could exit and remove if they wanted to allow that. Oh, I see. Okay. Versus, you know, just allowing somebody to um, uh, have a screenshot. Right, right. But, you know, there, there are obviously are marketplaces around tickets, you know, Ticketmaster, StubHub, those kind of things. Yeah. But they are high fees and they are the, they're, you know, the master of their little kingdoms. Yeah. And you're kind of up to their rules. But what if I wanted to sell you my Braves tickets and transfer them? I, I mean, I can hand you cash or we could do something outside the system and then I can at least in the Braves ticket example, I know that we can come in and we can transfer them within the app. Right. But it's not truly portable, right? Um, making them more portable, making it where, again, we could do an anything to anything transaction. I want Braves tickets. Yeah. And uh, you have, you know, Casey coins, but I don't want Casey coins. So, well, that comes back down to, and we don't have it on our list, I don't think. Well, we did uh, maybe the top at uh, contracts. Mm. It comes back to the contract too, right? Smart contracts, you, you, yeah. You could, you could work compensation into, um, and in, into the, the blockchain, right? Right. Good was ex- or you executed your deal. Mm-hmm. I paid, you know, check. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, smart contracts can be anything that code can functionally be written for. Yeah. Is there Which, any one place now you can do a smart contract? Yeah. I mean, Ethereum is that's basically all Ethereum is. For all so you and I could probably figure out how to do a smart contract. But what about me and a seventy year old man? <laughs> Do you mean writing a smart contract? <laughs> right, yeah, um, and, and executing a... Who, it, who's not technically savvy? Pro- probably um, not, Probably right? not. There may be some kind of website out there with like a, a GUI that you can go in and drag and drop things. <laughs> yeah. Again, may, maybe not, um, but we need to get there. This is early days still. Yeah, exactly. They, they probably think you're trying to pull something. And I think them. at the end of the day, you know, if we fast forward, it's not like you and I or a 70-year-old is going to need to know how to write a smart contract. Yeah, it's no, going to be, be executing your, one. Right, but it's going to be so simple where you could be in some kind of website or interface where you're just basically saying, you know, you're basically, again, dragging and dropping. This is this half the deal. That's this half the deal. These are the conditions, whatever it may be. Yeah. And run, click a button. And it's, We should I think develop it's, that. I could totally see the use for that. Yeah, and I, I mean, to me, that world is coming. It's just regulations is part of it, not to True. drag regulations in on this again, but it's... You know, crypto only can do so much right now without. But, but think about that on top of like Venmo. Mm-hmm. So you already have the money payment platform. Why not add an agreement? Well, Venmo, I would say, is a siloed payment provider. So you're requiring us both to have Venmo accounts. Uh, yeah, true. Um, I figured you'd have to have some type of account regardless. But, but potentially, but you have a wallet that maybe you don't want to keep at PayPal because you don't trust them. Oh, True. Which probably shouldn't trust PayPal. So it needs to, you need to be able to attach a third party. Right. Or you could have your own literally self-custody wallet that you attach to a transaction. Yeah. Or you could, or it could be your bank account. So you know, PayPal PayPal could be the first, I guess. They, they like could. More um, in, heck, just a couple of weeks ago, they announced they're working on a PayPal um, a stable coin. That's going to be U.S. dollar backed by Paxos, I think. Um, mm. And everyone trumpets them as being really forward thinking. I'm like, 
but <laughs> that already exists. <laughs> right. But not at PayPal. <laughs> right. Yes. And not good, with, mar- not good with marketing. The, not with the email campaigns that yeah. PayPal has. I think I get I mean, an email from them every day. <laughs> that and, you know, PayPal obviously has deep um, regulatory roots where they, like even the New York um, Financial Services um, Department came out and endorsed it, but also wasn't endorsing some cryptos that were even XRP that has clarity from the courts. I'm like, this is such a zoo. <laughs> so anyways. So tell me about ad free tracking. Yeah, this is interesting to me. So I, you know, you can use different browsers on your computers, your phones. Um, you know, if you have an iPhone, you probably have Safari, you might have Chrome, right. Um, you know, or internet Explorer. If you're on a PC, there's Firefox as well. There's a version of Chrome that Google does not make, but since it's open source, this group is taken. They call it Brave, is the browser. It works just like Chrome, but it has privacy blocking stuff in it. So you don't have all the tracking that happens normally. Is that like DuckDuckGo? Um, DuckDuckGo is a search engine that actually they do plug Brave into. Oh, okay. But it's a, you know, it's a browser that is privacy focused and um, blockchain enabled, if you want to call it that. You know, it, it, it prevents all the tracking stuff, pixel tracking, all that kind of, the, the, where your identity or your patterns get sold off. Yeah. Without your, um, you know, really saying yes or no. In a world where everybody was using a browser that was enabled, and it didn't have to be brave, but say all the browsers were crypto enabled, you could have a small wallet attached to it. And when you went to go read an article, instead of seeing ads or feeling like your identity is being stolen slash sold out from underneath you, you're paying fractions of a second to per, you know, fractions of a penny per second, effectively, to read an article. You read as much as you want, and then you leave, and then that transaction is done. Mm. So you're paying the ad revenue they would have gotten, right? I mean, obviously, it's there. not like all of a sudden the internet needs to be free because that's just not a thing, right? But it's a replacement because you are, if you're not paying for something, you are the product, whether people really right. process it that way or not, right? And it's it's not like it has to be super expensive. Like all these paywalls you may run into, like, oh, I want to go read this article and I'm also on some random website and they show me the first paragraph. I'm like, thanks, but I'm not going to pay you your dollar for the month for, mm-hmm. to read this thing. It's, it's not, that is, there's not that much content there on this article for me. So there are some websites, um, not tons, that are supporting this whole, they detect that you have a blockchain-enabled browser. They, they can tell a wall it's there and all of a sudden you can see the whole article. Mm-hmm. You scroll, you scroll, scroll. If you get the bottom, you've paid for whatever you've, you know, however long it took you to read. Right. So maybe fast readers get a deal <laughs> and you kind of get to move on and uh, you don't, you don't become a product being sold. So. Yeah. That's m- most of the stuff you see on the internet at the bottom of the article you're reading and all the pictures and the crazy. Oh yes. bait, That's exactly what that is. You're the product. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, this is an example of, blockchain being used and people never realize and they're using blockchain because mm. you could well if the world evolves and a lot of people are doing it like yeah. i know that i'm doing it now because i can't put us dollars in there and pay with us dollars okay you put crypto in there in whatever crypto you can hold it automatically transfers it to the crypto they want to receive super simple it's that anything mm. to anything type transaction right the the cool thing though is with crypto it's more than two decimal places deep they're mostly like six, eight, ten decimal places deep. So they can do super small fractions, which make this work. And you're not paying the the fees to Visa and MasterCard and Discover, which basically means the transaction can be no less than a dollar or people are losing money. Oh, yeah. You know, that's kind of the, roughly the break even. And, you know, in a blockchain world, they can be fractions of a penny. So. Um, last point for how blockchain will change the world, uh, combat corruption and government spending. Yeah. And when I made these notes, don't you, don't you need all parties to be okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? And I probably should have spent in any kind of spending, you know, whether it's nonprofits, anything like that, but you know, there's with things on a blockchain it's transparent. You can kind of see what's happening. You may not have all the details because if something goes off chain, obviously it's not there, but you know, when I was making these notes, I was reading about the Ukraine stuff. And I know that's a super hot topic about money going to Ukraine. Is it being spent wisely? Right. Even from that standpoint, or is it, you know, where is it going after that? But the ability to see as a citizen where the money's going, I think promotes trust. 
and obviously there's less and less of that each day, but like there's some, right. something the government could do. And again, it's not like the government's going to immediately put all their transactions through a blockchain. It may start in a small pocket national parks or who knows what it's going to start with. But right. like, I, it seems like it will end up there and you know, there could be groups that advocate for or against different kinds of spending, you know, the, the whole RFP process to work with a government agency to do something that they need done is already a relatively public process. Is, is it f- free of um, corruption? Probably not. Right. So th- there's other layers there that I think this can help kind of start ta- to tackle. So, Robert, thanks for your uh, insight on this. Uh, certainly, you know, from an investment standpoint, you know, there's, there's limited ways to access this, but I, I think that as, as companies surface, this is something that, um, you know, indexers like me will, will, will grab this, uh, very differently. Yeah. <laughs> now in any one specific company, you know, yeah, but, totally. but there's, um, there's definitely a big future here and there's, that's why we do these crypto, uh, special edition podcasts is, is because I just want to help educate people about what's coming down. Mm-hmm. It's coming down the pike, right? Yeah. I mean, I recently we just uh, remodeled our, our basement and I took out a ton of DVDs. <laughs> I don't watch movies over and over again. Yeah. So I'm, I love this digital age of just rent it for $3.99 <laughs> and yeah. I'm just done and I, it's out. Yep. But uh, when our kids were little, we have DVDs for the for the car, mm. but you don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but as I was hauling it all to Goodwill, thinking to myself going, I remember when we bought all these thinking that how like oh we don't have vhs anymore right mm-hmm. so we went to vhs the dvd then we have a few blu-rays mm. but our kids were getting older then yeah and and we started streaming things more and yep. so blu-ray just went yeah blu-ray was very short-lived <laughs> yes but it's a um you know technology waves in my opinion are accelerating in how fast they happen so it does maybe make sense that blu-ray was quicker i, I think it kind of got caught between obviously DVD and streaming for yeah, sure. Yeah. So. And then streaming, and then even with streaming, we were streaming, but now we're streaming in 4k. Right. So it's, it's moving so fast. Mm-hmm. And for people to say, Oh, this crypto stuff is, is, um, is fake. It's uh, someone made says it's a Ponzi scheme who right. doesn't know the true definition of a Ponzi scheme. scheme. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but it's, it's, um, it's definitely something coming down and you have to be able to open your mind up and, and learn about this. Um, we have a, a few episodes uh, you might be interested in episode 172 uh, tips to secure your password in cryptocurrency assets. I think that's even more important now than ever. Mm-hmm. Um, smart people who do bad things um, seem to be in plethora these days. Yep. Um, we did have a special recently XRP gets clarity. You might, might want to listen in on that one. That's just more of, um, uh, some of the government rulings that have come down with, uh, with XRP. Um, but yeah, uh, Robert, if they want to reach out to you directly, how would they reach out to you? Uh, just shoot me an email at Robert at Teton crypto And we'll make sure we add that to our show notes. Um, thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about Wiser Wealth Management or Teton Crypto Capital, um, you can schedule a consultation with one of our fiduciary financial advisors or directly with Robert. Uh, you can do that at wiserinvestor.com. Uh, thanks for listening, and Robert, we'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced and edited by Ken Hopley.